This week on Go Check Yourself, it's our final episode on season five. I guess you could say that it's sort of like our one. No, 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 don't say it. Don't say it. Last. Haven't you read the DVD cover? Mission. No! That's right. Here we are. We're talking about season five at last, or should I say, finally, the season five finale of Go Chuck Yourself. Hello, my name is Chris Gillespie, and it is a pleasure to be reunited with you, listener. Is it a pleasure to be reunited with me, Chris? It is just okay to be reunited <laughs> with you, Aaron. My name is Aaron Arata, and uh, ooh, that stings. <laughs> And uh, it took a while uh, for us to do this. We haven't put out an episode in a few weeks. We've kind of uh, had a lot going on. Aaron, I noticed that you have a, a different background behind you uh, this, this afternoon. It would be uh, it would be very funny if I had put up like a different picture of Chuck that I usually have as my Zoom virtual background. But yes, I uh, recently moved. Ah, congratulations. Much like uh, Delhi, De- Delhi, much like Devin and Ellie <laughs> to Chicago, I have uh, left my uh, one LA apartment, um, but just gone to another one. So maybe I should have said much like Sarah and Chuck moving from one apartment in LA to a- another location in LA. There's mm-hmm. a-, a house minus still an apartment, but um, or like uh, I did move in with my partner who I was already living with, so it's not really that a that big of a surprise, but sort of like uh, Morgan and Alex moving in together Mm -hmm. into another LA apartment. Do they move into Casey's old apartment? Is that, they do, yeah. And he leaves. Mm -hmm. So, so not like that. It was, it was very much not like that. I did not move into my father and or father figures apartment who had previously been my roommate and or boss. That's, that's not what's going on here. (laughs) But yes, I am in a new location. Yeah, well, that's good. I, uh, I'm glad that your new apartment is working out. I am a little disappointed that there is no courtyard in the apartment once again, but that's fine. So in addition to Aaron's new apartment, there's been, uh, two somewhat, well, I think they're very amusing, somewhat uncanny things happening in the world of Chuck, in the world of my relationship to Chuck since we've last recorded, we were last time we were watching, we had watched all the episodes, we watched all the bonus content. So we basically have seen everything that Chuck has to offer for the most part. I don't want to speak out of place. I don't know what we're missing. But once we've done this, it was like almost immediately after they added Chuck to HBO Max. Yeah, they did which is a streaming service that I already had. I actually have. I continue to have. I was planning on having it. Uh, Chuck was never available on any streaming service that I've had for... It was on Amazon. I didn't have Amazon. So I'd, ever, I'd have to pay to watch Chuck. Um, that's So I'd have the DVDs. But I just think it's weird. And it feels like the end of like when you complete a video game or something and then you unlock like all the outfits or like you get cheat codes or bonuses or whatever <laughs> i feel yeah. like by finally watching all of the episodes i unlock the ability to watch chuck for i'm not i mean it's not free but you know much easier than uh picking out the dvd out of the dvd case opening vlc media player <laughs> pressing play <laughs> It's hard. It's, it sounds insane when you uh, say it out loud like that, but that is what I had done for uh, however many episodes of Chuck there are. I guess 90, maybe? Um, so we've talked before about how my dad, I don't know if we've talked about this before, but it is a fact known to you and I that my dad uh, doesn't text me very often. He doesn't like his phone. So I get maybe like one text a month from him. And on February 11th at 5.47 p.m., he texted me with no preamble, no hello, no anything. The last text I had from him was deep into January. He says, HBO just picked up the series Chuck. And I said, thanks for the info. And he said, okay. It was a nice little conversation. He was uh, keeping me abreast of everything. Based on the way he framed it, which might have just been his understanding of what he read about it, it did sound like HBO was going to be continuing the series, Chuck. So I got pretty Mm -hmm. excited. 
Um, right. I have read articles that say like Zachary Levi has said, like he's not opposed to that happening. It's possible. They're still kind of talking about a movie. So it could be coming down the road, but uh, no, it is just on HBO Max, making it a little bit easier for people who have HBO Max to watch it. And I think it's a step in the positive direction, because I do think that if there was going to be like a a reboot episode or something that it would be on HBO Max. So I think that it would uh, I'm not saying that this means anything, but I think that it would probably I don't know. I think this would be the the first step in something happening. So I think hopefully uh, it is a good sign for things to come in the Chuck world. It can air alongside the uh, new YA magic supernatural uh, drama Theodosia, which uh, HBO Max has been heavily promoting. I don't know if to everyone or just to me, it does sound like it's up my alley. So um, (laughs) might uh, start go Theodosia yourself now that we're uh, done with this. I have not seen that one. They've been pushing the uh, the one about pirates. Yep, I, guess. I watched that last night because it okay. <laughs> promoted it to me. There, there's a lot of billboards um, like ambulance. Uh, Our flag means death. The new Taika Waititi pirate show is everywhere in LA. Unlike uh, the Foo Fighters horror movie, which I have learned is called Studio Six Six Six. Is that what it's called? That's correct. Okay, cool. Uh, anyhow, so then the other part of the Chuck, the exciting benefit, the exciting reward, the universe bestowed upon me for finishing all the episodes of Go Chuck Yourself and analyzing them in depth the way that we do here at Go Chuck Yourself was that I was reunited with my Nerd Herd t-shirt, which I'm wearing right now. I, I thought it was gone forever. I forgot there was such a story behind that. I just, I, I complimented you on it when we started uh, recording, but... You finally found it. I find I thought it was gone forever because I, uh, listener, this might be hard for you to hear, but prior to go Chuck yourself starting, I thought that my days of Chuck were behind me permanently, and I was uh. weeding out, you know, t-shirts and whatnot, and I could have sworn that this was in the like go to Goodwill bag, but uh, apparently the bag that it ended up in was a Halloween costume bag <laughs> in my mom's basement. And she was cleaning out her basement recently. And she's like, hey, I found this Chuck shirt in this bag of Halloween costumes. And I was like, what? And this once again was like around the same time that HBO Max has Chuck and mm-hmm. we finished. And so uh, I was very excited to be reunited with it because I thought that it was gone forever. But it turns out. Well, it looks it, great. It, it was just waiting for me to be ready for it. I had to like uh, earn its respect. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's it's like a like a wild horse. You have to um, make make it respect you. Before I had to it prove will. myself. Yeah. Yes, the, the shirt's like you want to wear me. You got to watch and record episodes about every single episode of Chuck. I can actually like I don't know if this happened, but I can I can so clearly picture like a younger you like agonizing over whether you want to get rid of this shirt or not, and then finally deciding like. I'll put it with Halloween costumes as like a way of keeping it, but not having to deal with it on the regular, which is like, it, yeah, that's, that sounds like something I would do. It also kind of sounds like something you would do. Um, it, it sounds like it is what I did. perhaps. <laughs> so uh, the big question on my mind is like, will you wear that out? Like if you're going on a date, if you're going like to a bar with the friends, will you wear it with a blazer? Will it be part of your ro- rotation or is it just like a special occasion shirt? Uh, that's a good question. I haven't really thought of it. I was, I haven't really thought about it until getting ready to record right now. I don't know. It might just be like a recording shirt. I don't, I, I guess I could walk around in it and sort of end up promoting go chuck yourself as a result of that. But that feels kind of weird. It's like, I mean, it's, there's not like you've, I, I bought you in college a Chuck shirt that had a big picture of Chuck on it and Sarah and and Sarah. And I, it was green. Yeah. And it was bright green. Um, and then we also have like, or you also have the nerd herd polo. I think I this is a lot more like if you, especially if you're wearing it under a blazer like that or under a mm. sweater, it's not really like noticeable what it is. That might mean people ask you what it is. And then you have to explain like, oh, it's from Chuck. And we do a podcast about Chuck. Like that was my impression of you. Um, it's pretty good. But I, yeah, I, I think it looks like a reasonable t-shirt that someone would wear. My other idea was um, 
whatever, whatever occasion, perhaps like a gala or a wedding, perhaps even my wedding or even your own wedding, when you're wearing like a, a suit, like sometimes people will wear like a t-shirt under a suit. I don't, I don't know why you do that. I, I don't mm-hmm. wear suits, but I have seen it happen. Um, so maybe like under a suit at like the next really fancy event you're at, you could be wearing your nerd herd shirt, keeping it close to your heart. Like one of our uh, very well-known Go Chuck Yourself fundraising galas that we often have yes, to mm-hmm. raise money for Go Chuck Yourself. Yeah. Uh, with all, <laughs> and we've, I, we've spent that money on good things. We have. <laughs> things, things that go right back to the fans. <laughs> all of it goes directly back to <laughs> you, the listener. Uh, so we're going to be talking about season five today. And it's just we're going to sum up our thoughts, our feelings, everything we're going to close the book on season five which means that i guess we're kind of closing the book on chuck which is weird but it is what we are here to do today and so i wanted to start things off by saying uh or kind of offering a recap of the events of season five just as a refresher Mm -hmm. uh because it's been a bit and uh so just to make sure that we're in the right headspace so when season four ends chuck and sarah are married and they received close to a billion dollars from Alexei Volkov. <laughs> yes. Which was weird as I was writing it, but I was like, this is what happens. <laughs> so they used this money to quit the CIA and start their own private spy firm. That's called Carmichael Industries. They keep their headquarters in Castle, which they do by purchasing the Buy More and everything above and below it. So Chuck no longer has the Intersect, and they seem to be rid of the Intersect for good, but then... Uh, Morgan accidentally uploads it to himself at the very end of season four. So that was a season four recap. So tell me what happens in season five. Morgan uh, gets more involved than ever in Team Bartowski. Mm-hmm. And Chuck has to become Morgan's handler, which leads to a lot of uh, tension, but also some comedy. Most of the tension comes from the fact that Morgan has been acting like a jerk ever since he's gotten the intersect. He becomes less and less like himself and becomes really self-absorbed and rude. His relationship with Alex has, uh, or his relationship with Alex had been going well, but when the intersect corrupts his brain, uh, he decides that he's too good for her. He breaks up with her over a text message. The big, big sticking point. Does not sit well with Casey at all, which is uncomfortable because Casey has to work with Morgan. Chuck and the team eventually save Morgan's brain by appealing to his memories of his old self. They convince him to de-install the intersect, so everything's okay on that front. As Carmichael Industries enters the private sector, they encounter Gertrude Verbansky, who is the owner of a rival security firm, uh, Verbansky Core. I think it's Verbansky Core, yes. They square off against her a couple times, which is complicated because she has a past and a huge crush on Casey. We get to see Casey navigate this relationship, and Gertrude ends up becoming a powerful ally for Team Bartowski. You, you can't see, but I have a big smile on my face the whole time Chris is describing this, thinking about my contemporary Carrie Ann Moss. And all this is good because uh, Team Bartowski needs all the help that they can get. They might be done with the CIA, but the CIA isn't done with them. Enter Clyde Decker, who is the stinkiest stinker of them all. He's a big stinker. <laughs> he harasses the group uh, for a few episodes before Verbansky blows him up in a very dramatic <laughs> fashion. And... Uh, That is the end of Clyde Decker. Thank God. Get him out of here. But Carmichael Industries isn't in the clear yet. Someone seems to have been using Decker to get to Chuck and Sarah. The same person unleashes a powerful computer uh, computer virus out into the world, and it it causes some trouble. Uh, We're not really clear about the extent of the trouble. (laughs) It goes from being a major crisis to not that big of a deal. We found out that the mystery suspect in this case is one Daniel Shaw, who's been plotting his revenge in an overseas prison. Another big smile on my face. Is it an overseas prison? I thought he was in, like, isn't he in, like, Smallville? Was he in Smallville? I thought he was overseas. I thought he was in, like, because wasn't there a joke where, or, like, we thought it was maybe a reference to how he was on, or, like, it was Clarkville. That's what it was called. It was Clarkville. Um, I don't remember. Wherever Superman's from, presumably, is that... Iowa, Kansas, Illinois. Let's let's find Missouri? out. Missouri. Where is Superman from? Krypton. That's not helpful. <laughs> <laughs> um. In, 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 I think Illinois. 
or Kansas. Metropolis is in Illinois, and Smallville is in Kansas. Okay, solved it. Carry on with the truck. I don't know if that solved if Shaw was overseas or not. I thought he was in Europe for some reason. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe I, I mean, he's a very worldly man, so he could have yeah. been anywhere. Where he is, in the world he, is Daniel, Daniel Shaw. Daniel Shaw. He eventually makes his way to the Buy More on Christmas Eve of all nights. There's a dramatic hostage situation and a climactic battle between he and Chuck, which Chuck narrowly wins. Yeah, climactic is right. <laughs> sorry, I'm really sorry. Uh, <laughs> so Chuck narrowly wins his fight with Shaw with the help of Ellie, who is also at the Buy More. With Shaw and the Omen virus taken care of, the team has a chance to tie up some loose ends. Sarah must protect her mother and her adopted daughter slash sister from her old handler. Morgan must win back Alex and Casey and proves that he prove that he's not a jerk anymore. Casey wants to figure out if he can be himself and keep his career while also being in a relationship with Verbansky. Chuck and Sarah want to exit the spy life permanently and buy a house and start a family. Now, this would probably be a good time to explain what's going on at the buy more. <laughs> After a near fatal accident involving carbon monoxide, Jeff is almost killed in the Bymore's off forgotten auto repair center. Devin fortunately intervenes and examines him and realizes that Jeff has been suffering from low grade carbon monoxide poisoning his entire life. Under Devin's guidance, Jeff stays away from carbon monoxide for the first time and begins living a healthier lifestyle, which benefits him almost immediately. Lester doesn't know what to do uh, like with this new Jeff and he longs for the days of old Jeff so he tries various schemes to poison Jeff again with carbon monoxide. Fortunately, none of these schemes work, which is be good, uh, which is good because Jeff and Lester become pivotal players in the season's events. They manage to solve the Omen virus, and they also find out the truth about Team Bartowski, which facilitates them eventually saving the day using the arsenal of weapons that Casey keeps in his Crown Vic. Things seem to be going pretty well until we are introduced to Nicholas Quinn a former CIA agent who's been gunning after the Intersect for years. Frustrated that he never received the Intersect like he was promised, he's made it his life's mission to get the Intersect and become the most powerful spy in the world. He almost succeeds, that is, until Sarah uploads the Intersect before he can. Sarah, of course, gets a faulty version of the Intersect, which quickly corrodes her mind and memories. Although without making her an asshole like Morgan, the new priority then becomes to stop Quinn and save Sarah's brain before it's too late. This takes the team to Japan for some unknown reason before <laughs> returning them to the States, except not as a united team. Quinn somehow manages to kidnap Sarah and brainwash her into thinking that she works for him and the CIA and that Team Bartowski are the real bad guys. He instructs her to capture the Intersect and bring it to him as soon as she can. Chuck knows something's up with Sarah, but he can't put his finger on it until Sarah double crosses Team Bartowski. After a dramatic conflict, Chuck manages to get through to Sarah somewhat but not enough to return her to her old self. Sarah goes on a mission to take down Quinn, but insists that she must do it on her own since she doesn't remember Chuck and she can't trust him. Chuck manages to win her over somewhat, so she agrees to work with Team Bartowski to stop Quinn once and for all. And this uh, this leads to a globe-trotting adventure where they go to Berlin. It's reminiscent of the premiere episode of Chuck. All of this comes to a climax at the uh, Symphony Hall in Los Angeles. Quinn has planted a bomb that threatens to blow up the entire symphony hall, including Beckman and visiting Chinese dignitaries. With the help of Jeffster and Irene Demova, Chuck manages to defuse the bomb and save the day. Sarah shoots Quinn on the rooftop uh, and kills him once and for all. Afterwards, the team says their goodbyes. Ellie and Devin get ready to move to Chicago for exciting new job opportunities. Jeff and Lester are offered a uh, recording contract from a German record executive. Casey is on his way to go be with Verbansky and gives Morgan and Alex uh, his apartment. Sarah intends to go off on her own to rediscover herself, effectively ending her and Chuck's marriage. Chuck is sad about this, understandably, and tries one last time to get through to her. He finds her at the beach that they visited at the end of the first episode. This is Malibu, but not really Malibu, right? Yes, it is actually San Pedro. Chuck explains that he'll always be there for her regardless of what she decides to do. And Sarah asks him to tell them their story, which he does. Afterwards, he shares that Morgan had a theory that Sarah's memories might come back once she and Chuck share a kiss. And uh, But he brushes it off. But Sarah asks him to kiss her. So he does. And they kiss for a while on the beach. <laughs> and that's the show. Wow, that was really comprehensive. Do you think I missed anything? I mean, I 
I think you missed quite a few things that we'll be mentioning throughout this uh, throughout this episode. But you you hit you hit all the beats. It really made me think like a lot happened this season. So now we're gonna get into talking about the music of the show, music of the season specifically. So did you have any favorite music selections in season five? Of course I did. Okay, that's great to hear. Would you share them with me, if you'd be so kind? I have to um, give a special shout out uh, to Fun's song, We Are Young, in Chuck vs. the Baby. Um, I am a big Fun stan, as the kids say. And um, I had not remembered at all that this song appeared in Chuck, or in fact, probably like, I'm not going to say got its start in any way, but was probably newer in Chuck versus the Baby. Like that was around the time this song was becoming popular. So it was like a cool indie song at the time. Um, I liked the use of the song as well. It's like playing in the final like montage of like, Chuck and Sarah um, interacting with a toddler who they will uh, never see again this season, possibly ever, um, and just having a good time with their family and friends in their classic courtyard at their dinner table, like doing all those things. So it's a good song for that. I don't know if it's like beyond the chorus entirely like appropriate, but it does uh, fit into the like indie rock, like having having a good time with friends and family uh, vibe of a lot of the songs that stand out to me. So that's my first pick. Do you want to say one or do you want me to go through the rest of my list? Well, I, I guess I, I kind of wrote down something similar to that or my thought sort of was that, well, I don't necessarily, I, I think Chuck in the previous seasons has, you know, great music, a lot of which we've discussed uh-huh. and has certainly like introduced me as a recent viewer to songs that are now meaningful to me, uh-huh. I feel like this season they really were kind of, I don't want to say they had their their finger on the pulse, but with We Are Young and then I had also written down, um, they have Don't Stop, Color on the Walls by uh-huh. Foster the mm-hmm. People and Gold on the Ceiling by Black yeah. Keys. Mm-hmm. These are like brand new songs at this yeah. time and that were either just becoming popular or mm-hmm. like had just come out and when the they were producing and editing the show in late 2011 early yeah. 2012 so i thought it was interesting that they had all these kind of big like really po- what would become really big popular alternative mm-hmm. indie songs yeah. that are really mainstream now they didn't usually have the they didn't really have that kind of um like they didn't really break songs like that in the yeah. earlier seasons I think that's really interesting. I also have to give a shout out to Jeff Sturr's version of Take On Me, yeah. which is a song that I've had a complicated relationship with. Um, but I think that their cover uh, with the orchestra is actually genuinely good. I don't know if I'm going to start adding it into my rotation, listening to it like in my daily life. Good, but it's definitely way better than Weezer's. Uh, was wondering if I had uh, ever made that joke before. I think you Um, did. Okay. Sounds like something I would say. And then um, my final top song pick for season five would, of course, be Rivers and Roads by The Head and the Heart. Um, This is a song that I knew before I saw this episode of Chuck, but it's now completely inextricable from Chuck and the Chuck finale in my mind whenever I hear it, which is pretty often because it is in my regular music rotation. I can't help but think about like the one magical kiss and Sarah's memories and all of those things. Um, I don't know exactly the history of this song at the moment, but it does feel like a lot more what you were describing of like a more like not that the head and the heart is underground, but like a little bit more than fun at the time. Like it does have the vibe of like a frightened rabbit or like a new pornographers or like one of those songs. Like it feels a lot more along those lines. So that in addition to it, just being like a genuinely good song makes it stand out. So rivers and roads, number one, season five, ride or die. Can I say something that uh, will be controversial? That's fine. I don't know. I don't really, I don't know if I like rivers and roads. That is pretty controversial. What what don't you know if you like about it? Well, I just it it like opposed to 
other moments in the show where it's maybe it's frying rabbit or it's so uh, like Ian Chuck specifically, or you don't know if you like the song in general. Uh, both. I okay. think. All right. All right. But explain Chuck wise. So the, it just, I don't know. I feel like there's been more like the music. There's been moments for me that are more affecting uh-huh. and memorable and emotional to me. And I don't know if it's just cause I never, I, I've never really had a relationship with the song prior mm-hmm. to That's fair. it doesn't really cement itself with me in the scene that it's in. Okay. Um, like I really want to, I wish that the, first, well, I mean, it's, this is just a me problem, I guess, but like, I wish that the show ended with one of those kinds of uh, emotional moments that I had experienced. So you before. wish that it ended with, with or without you by you too. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that the fifth season of Chuck's budget could definitely account for the, uh, the rights to a song by you two. But would uh, that have fit better? It's kind of kind of appropriate. I mean, like, accepting that it was, like, already used by friends and, like, a bunch of other things. It's used by friends? Yeah, isn't that, like, isn't With or Without You, like, the big Ross and Rachel final kiss thing? It is? Or, like, maybe their first kiss? It's, like, really? it's a big part of their relationship, I think. I mean, th- I we're kind of talking about Chuck right now. I don't really want to uh, <laughs> talk about another program called Friends. Uh... Are you looking I, it up? Was I sleeping on this? What is the deal? There's a lot of music clips on YouTube of it. Friends, huh. YouTube. Is it? Am I correct? I don't. Well, I don't understand if it was actually in the episode or if it, it was, was actually... absolutely, definitely in the episode. Interesting. Huh. I'll have to check that out later. Um. Yeah. I don't know. That's just my kind of i my dirty little secret about. That's totally rivers fair. Rivers and roads. You know, it's, I wish I liked it. It just doesn't. I was hoping it was going to have that spark for me this time. And it just didn't. It's totally OK. Um, I would like to take this moment, if you don't have anything more to say about music, to talk about uh, our friends at ChuckTV.net slash music, which is uh, takes great um, snapshots of all the songs featured in an episode and is also extremely helpful in describing what is going on in the episode when the song plays. I just wanted to um, drop a little, uh, drop, a, drop a few little descriptions that stood out to me um, from the music of season five page. Okay, yeah. So we have Hot, Hot, Hot by Buster Poindexter, of course, classic. Um, and the description of what is happening when that song plays is Chuck and Sarah get handsy with their fellow Buy More convention goers. I don't personally uh, remember... I, I definitely remember the man who turned out to have a bunny costume getting a little mm-hmm. handsy with Sarah, and maybe Chuck was flirting with someone while that was happening, but get handsy is is a little uh, strong of language, I would say. That description makes it sound like they were having an orgy in the <laughs> yeah, swimming pool. Yeah, it does. Well, I guess they were like throwing each other in the pool, right, and jumping in, and people are diving in with their clothes on. That's, yeah, that's fair enough. Was it, were we just totally oblivious to the sexual undertones? Or sexual overtones. Was your, was our uh, viewing experience (laughs) censored by Amazon and also the Chuck DVDs? (laughs) Does ChuckTV.net know something that we do not? (laughs) We'll have to ask. Um, They do also shout out uh, Danny Pudi's version of O Canada. They do, yes. (laughs) um, Which was nice. I like to see that. And then uh, my last shout out here is uh, No Siesta by MC Juan. Um, It is described as the scene in which Jeff and Lester spy on Morgan and Bo freaking Derek. And it's it's kind of nice because like her name is, of course, Bo Derek. Her middle name is not freaking. She does not have freaking as a nickname, but it's kind of nice to see the person writing being inspired by the feelings of the Chuck characters to really like get us in there and get us excited to see Bo freaking Derek. I felt like I was there. I felt like I was watching it once again, reading this description. This is such a nice, thoughtful uh, writing (laughs) workshop criticism of this webpage. I'm sure the author of the website appreciates it. Yeah, I think I think they did a great job. So keep, yes, keep if, it up for future seasons of Chuck. If you are someone who wants to see a comprehensive list of all the music that's ever been featured in Chuck, you should definitely check out ChuckTV.net because they do have a very comprehensive list of it. And it's something that we use for these episodes. So thank you to the people at ChuckTV.net for putting it together. You've You've done the Lord's work here. So speaking of people who do the Lord's work... 
Chuck is, you know, you have the core, the core cast of people, but then you also have these uh, ships that pass in the night, if you will. These people who, they're a, a bright star and they fly across the sky momentarily. I'm, of course, talking about guest stars, people who are in Chuck for a briefer period of time than a normal uh, character, I guess. If you are wondering why the sky was dark in 2011 and 2012, it's because all the stars were here in Chuck season five. Have we made that joke before? It seems like something we would have said. No, that was good. I think we're really starting to get into the groove of doing this podcast. <laughs> the Well, the guest star situation in season five gets a little tricky because we have some people who are supporting characters who appear multiple times. Mm-hmm. And then we have returning characters from previous seasons who only stop by to do like a one-off performance. True, and then yeah. we also have new celebrity cameos into the yes. mix. So it's a real mixed bag. I threw all of those things just into and under the guest star umbrella. Um, Absolutely. So good. Just put it all in the blender and just mix them all together and make a nice guest star smoothie. So first we have favorite guest star. Chris, who's your uh, your first favorite guest star of Chuck season five? I mean, does Carrie Ann Moss fit in this category? Okay, I, also, I also have her. She was going to be um, the, the final one that I named as, as most okay. important. I do think she counts... She's listed and credited as a guest star, so I think we have to name her as such, and I think she's such uh, a wonderful part of this season that I would like her to be uh, honored in some way. So I also have her on my list, and I will say, yes, you can have her. I mean, you can't have her. She's, she's, she's Casey's and also mine. You can't have her personally, but you can have her on your list. Get in line, buddy. <laughs> so then who else is on your list okay so um i have one recurring returning character who will not be surprising to anyone uh brandon routh Brandon in Chuck versus the santa suit i also have brandon routh he was my second one okay i'll talk he was my second one too actually wow. um i'll be talking more about him later but i think that he brings such a levity and familiarity to season five that made me wish that he had been there the whole time or at least was like there for more than one episode, but he did a fantastic job. It was great to see him. And uh, that's, it was just really great to see him. If you catch my drift. Levity, but also very menacing. It was a very menacing performance yeah. from, uh, from Brandon Routh this Which time. Which he so had done he before, did well. but it was yeah. like, it was very intense, like per- perhaps more intense than the season he was actually in. Yeah, I would agree with that. He was scary, but also kind of fun, but then also yeah. very scary. It yeah. was a very good villain, and the familiarity also uh, kind of amplified that as well. And then um, I I had intended to name him first, um, but I am actually naming him last, so I am placing him in that position of importance. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not name Stan Lee in Chuck vs. the Santa suit. <laughs> That's exactly who I have. Yes, as well. so we, we have, have the all same three list. Of <laughs> okay, well, let's see if we can uh, at least favorite guest star. Let's see if we can uh, get the same. <laughs> Stanley was great to see. Stanley, rest in peace, Stanley. Yeah, he was great. He was fun. He was fun. Least favorite guest stars. So we each I have think two we're of gonna, these. I think we're gonna have at least one of the same. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> do you wanna do you wanna do like a count of three, and we can both say our first one? <laughs> Sure. Okay. Three, two, one. Craig Rebecca Gilmore. Roman. Oh, damn Re- it. Rebecca remains my other one. Okay. And but Craig Gilmore was not my uh, second one. My my second one was Bo freaking Derek. Oh, okay. Yeah, she's good yeah. to have on that one. Uh, <laughs> not good in the episode, but good to have on the list. <laughs> well, she was. I don't know. I feel she like she was fine. Like she, she fine. did. She did. She was serviceable. What was asked of her? I would say it was just not very. Yeah. Uh, it, it was underwhelming. Craig Kilborn and Chuck versus the Zoom and Rebecca Romaine and Chuck versus the Curse to me were performances that made me actively go, "This is not good." Yeah. Remind me, Craig Kilborn. What What did he do? In- he was the he was the episode the first episode's villain. Just as a like, he was. They had to. Go to his like party. The, he was like a stock trader or something okay, like yes. that. All right. Yep. I remember now. And he was yeah, just, he was pretty bad. It was. <laughs> pretty I, bad. I wrote him out of my head. Uh, understandably so. Yeah. Rebecca Roman 
completely agree about that. I was, uh, she was no, um, Nicole. So then most underutilized guest star. This one will be interesting, I think. Uh, well, one of mine was Mark Hamill. Okay. I had him as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think if you're going to have Mark Hamill in an episode, you'd really, it would have been cool if he was the episode's villain. That would have been cool. He's Mark Hamill, but he was just making a cameo at the beginning. Yeah. He was like Russian. He was, he was doing like a little bit of an accent. He had some kind of funny little accent. Yeah. Um, it was nice to see him, but yes, I absolutely agree. Um, Maybe they just didn't have the budget to have him for the whole episode, but Mm -hmm. I would have liked to see him do a little more because, as you say, it's Mark Hamill. Um, I'm sure that the whole cast was like really jazzed to work with him. um, And I just would have liked to see that kind of like energy come through in the plot line of what he was doing. Right. So we're on the same page about Mark Hamill. We're on the same page about Mark Hamill. All right. This is this is the moment of truth. Um. Are we are we in agreement on these last? Mine is actually two people, but on the same uh, same bullet point. So I don't know. I think that we probably are. Okay. Then. All right. Maybe. You wanna... Do you have uh, Daniel Pudi and Yvette Nicole Absolutely Brown? Absolutely, I do. <laughs> All right, we are doing great. We're really on the same wavelength this episode. Um, that's of course in Chuck versus the Hack Off. Yeah, I. I really think like they are hilarious people. And I think that the uh, idea of having like the, the big Michelle and um, like replacement Lester, I think as he's Mm -hmm. referred to um, is comedy gold. And they were both well up to the task, but they're, they just don't get a ton to do, which is kind of a bummer. Right. They were just very, very brief cameos from the stars of community. It was almost as if they were trading on like, haha, you're seeing these people. Isn't that funny? Instead right. of like actually giving them like material to work with. Correct. I would say that's a good uh, good way to sum it up. These underutilized guest stars. We just got a brief taste and we yeah. wanted more opposed to Craig Kilborn and Rebecca Romain. We did not want any more of that. <laughs> we want that taste out of our mouths. Did you know, this is something that I learned uh, in researching for this episode, that Zachary Levi and Yvette Nicole Brown were a romantic item at one point? Really? Yeah. I did not know that. kind of made me like Zachary Levi a little more, knowing that he dated, like, a funny woman. Huh. Yeah, that's, I think that's cool. Interesting. I did, I was not aware of that. Yeah. NBC, making love connections at NBC. Just making, <laughs> yep. Hanging out at the Warner Brothers lot, just... <laughs> Stealing smooches, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so who do you wish we got to see in season five as a guest star who we did not see as oh. a reoccurring person? That's not on our list. I didn't think about it. Um, I mean, I will I will rattle off some. I would have liked to see Gary Cole. I always like seeing course. Gary Cole. Mm-hmm. Yep. Obviously, we always love seeing Stone Cold Steve Austin. So much. Nicole Richie. I would have know. loved to see Nicole Richie. Ben Savage. I, I don't know why you come back. I don't know. But... <laughs> um, I don't know if I needed to see him. Did you? Uh, I don't know if you read this piece of trivia um, that originally Fidek and Schwartz were planning to bring uh, Scott Dracula back. What? Um, like have it be that he hadn't really died, but then they thought that the emotional. Um, yeah, I read this. Um, <laughs> they thought that the. Uh, the heartbreak that the Bartowski family went through at his loss um, would be undercut by implying that he had not really died and he was coming back. Um, so he, they decided to keep him dead. But um, he had the potential to be a recurring character that reappeared. Right. That I'm glad that I appreciate that they, that's how they handled it because it definitely would have been borderline offensive if yeah. they brought him back after <laughs> I would all of that. um this is someone who was actually in uh season five, but I would have liked to see a little more of maybe Sarah's mother um or Sarah's sister slash daughter. Yeah. Um they it felt odd that they did not appear more than just in that single episode. So I would have liked to see them a little more. That is also fair. And that was um the actress playing her mom is a uh, former Charlie's Angel. Former former Charlie's Angel, uh, whose name escapes both of us right now. I know that you texted me that she was attractive at one point, but I can't remember her name. Either. I did. It is Cheryl Ladd. Yes, Cheryl Ladd. Thank you, Cheryl You're Ladd. Anytime. Now 
We're going to be talking about, I guess, uh, episodes, favorite episode, least favorite episode, and uh, our favorite So Bad It's Good episode. Yep. Guess we'll see if we're still in sync here or not. I think we might be. I think we might be as well. So what do you think is your favorite? So my favorite episode, I'm going to have to say, and I'm... I kind of accepted the last two episodes from this, so if if that's where your mind automatically went, that's totally fine. But I'm going to say my the best time I had watching Chuck season five was Chuck versus the Santa suit, probably for um, like Shaw related reasons. I would say that Decker and Quinn were the other like big villains of season five, and I would say that they were both unequivocally uh, lame. Mm-hmm. And I think that. Shaw, even though he was just in one episode, like, again, brought that kind of sense of levity, danger, like, made things that in other episodes, like the Omen virus, we weren't really clear on what it did or how bad it was, but knowing that Shaw was involved in it even made it, like, feel a little bit more scary. Um, Seeing, like, his uh, encounter with Sarah was disturbing but exciting. Um... And I think that that episode had a level of humor that was really appealing um, and a style of jokes and cameos and um, implications that really worked for me. I liked uh, that Chuck and Beckman had to kiss. Um, That was uh, appropriately scandalizing and embarrassing and funny, um, even though it did lead to me feeling weird about the parallels between um, Sarah feeling like she had to admit that she kissed Shaw, uh, whatever, that was weird. But um, the rest of the episode was funny. I always love a good Christmas episode, gets me in the holiday spirit, even if I'm watching it uh, in not Christmas times. So had a great time with Chuck versus the Santa suit, and I would say probably my favorite of the season. It is also my favorite Whoa! of the season. I cannot really offer a better description than that, but I... I feel like it was just really firing in all cylinders. I feel like it was kind of one of the only instances in the season of like all the things that like when Chuck works well, all like the comedy and the drama, the heartfelt feelings feel like it just had all of them and really was like a really classic episode of Chuck. And I think the the strong point of the season for me as well. I really agree. And for me. Great. Okay. So then your least favorite episode. My least favorite episode. So I feel like I do have to shout out here that going into season five, I did say there's an episode this season that I hate. That is the worst episode of Chuck I've ever seen. Um, And that, of course, was Chuck versus Bo. I do have it listed here um, under least favorite episode. I actually have two uh, contenders for this. I think Chuck versus Bo was not as bad as I uh it it was not offensive in the way that I had remembered there were definitely some offensive parts that we will get into later but it was okay I think I remembered Morgan like still having the intersect and still being an asshole throughout that episode which obviously was not the case I think if that had been going on it would probably unequivocally be my least favorite episode of the season but it was just kind of underwhelming and didn't really feel of a piece like it felt like they had finished the morgan is the intersect plotline and then we're like let's actually go back to that well like it didn't really make any sense to me why they right. would do that mm-hmm. um i do also want to name chuck versus the curse which was just kind of uh had the had the rebecca romaine issue um, I think it, this episode was just kind of disappointing to me because it was trying to do something interesting. I did kind of like the idea of bringing Ellie and Devin back into the spy world, but just like the behavior, the stakes in this episode were all not really well defined and not really very good. So it was just kind of a bummer to watch. Um, and then, of course, we had some guest star issues as well. I was thinking as I was looking over the list of the episodes in preparation for this, and I saw the Chuck versus the Curse one, and I was like, "Oh, I, I'm like, did we like this one?" Because I was like, "Oh, this was one with Ellie and Devin." I, yeah. And then I was looking at my notes from our episode of mm-hmm. it, and I was like, "Oh, I really did not like yeah. this episode." I I said it was very boring. It, yeah. it did not like it wasn't memorable, and um, I guess there were also weird things in it too about them going to uh, the Roadhouse where they had their meeting with Beckman. Right. Mm-hmm. 
And then they also introduced the Chuck and Morgan's pants in that yeah. episode. Yeah, pants is a, a a big, big bad thing from Chuck vs. the Curse. So it was that one is. Yeah, that was kind of a bummer that that didn't work better because yeah. it just that was a very weird one. Yeah. Um, I called out Chuck versus the Bullet Train as okay. my least mm-hmm. favorite episode. And I think we kind of talked about it in our episode about it, but. It just felt so forced and weird, mm-hmm. and I think maybe part of the, like the strikes against it for me are kind of it's like because it's the third to last episode, right? So it's this episode, and it's kind of when at this point the feeling starts to sink in. You're like, oh, maybe the finale is not going to be that good, mm-hmm. or maybe where they're what they're going to do with these last three episodes is not what I was expecting. Or it's absolutely not fair. Gonna hit it out of the park and. I thought the train stuff was just why I don't understand why they went to Japan. Yeah. I just don't get it. Yeah. Uh, I thought it just felt weird. I felt like they wanted to do an episode on a train and they just sort of forced it to happen, but there was no consequences or no reason for it. And, um, you know, the stakes, I guess, in it are pretty good Mm -hmm. because Sarah is trying to get her memory and you do have Jeff and Lester becoming the heroes Mm -hmm. in that episode back at the Buy More. Mm -hmm. So there is some. I guess some fun stuff in it, but I just kind of it just fills me with a sense of like, uh yeah. Oh, and that's what and Quinn kept getting thrown out of the speeding yeah. train. <laughs> you had and a didn't big die. problem with that one. And kept, yeah. So I just I didn't care for that one, I guess. Yeah, that's totally fair. <laughs> but I guess my favorite of these categories is the favorite so bad it's good episode. Okay, so I actually struggled with this. So why don't yeah. why don't you go first? Well, I, I sort of struggled with it, but the one that I kept coming back to Because I was initially thinking, like, well, is this Chuck versus the curse? But I'm like, no, it seems like I just didn't like this one. But an episode, and I think I had, I don't know. I I put Chuck versus Sarah for this one. Okay, all right. Because I I didn't hate it, Uh but I also think there were things in it that were, ended up, based on our discussion of it afterwards, that I started finding funny after the fact. Okay. Because of the, I don't know what exactly it would be, but the... The fact that that Sarah is evil now, kind of, and Yvonne and Chuck are going against Yvonne and Zach are going against each other. Mm-hmm. Um, there was something funny and a little bit over the top about that. Mm-hmm. I think specifically was there's a scene with Ellie when they're in a car. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, and yep. she drives it off the road and hits another car, <laughs> yeah. which struck us as very funny for yeah. some reason. So I think it's a very dramatic, intense episode, but it's also sort of funny when you look at it through the lens of. Sarah losing her mind and just <laughs> trying to <laughs> extract revenge against the Bartowskis for all that they put her through over the past five seasons. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> so similarly to that, um, I have Chuck versus the baby. Um, yeah, which I was, that was on. That was the thing about that one too. Yeah, I think typically when we've used so bad it's good in the past, it's been like. So cold, Steve Austin's yeah, been like involved. something <laughs> that made us laugh. Um, and I would say there was there was not a lot this season that like really like it felt like a lot more of like things bummed me out. Um, yeah, things were like not as good as I wanted them to be, and it made me sad. So there wasn't really like a feeling as much of so bad it's good. But then I was thinking about Sarah stabbing the man in Chuck versus the baby, um, and how. It's really, truly ridiculous how, like, the baby only came up that one time, never comes up again. <laughs> Sarah's mother never really comes up again. Um, it's it's not good, but it is uh, funny. So that's that's the closest I could come in season five. There wasn't, like, a yeah. Chuck versus the murder. I guess that was just bad, but it's on my mind. Chuck versus the baby was a good one, too, because they had to go to what they went to Budapest Budapest yeah Bucharest I I, Um, I think it was Budapest and they were in that mansion the whole time for everything or whatever it was they pushed that man down the stairs right that was yeah yeah, and he disappeared (laughs) immediately after they used the Wilhelm scream I think I think this is so bad it's good (laughs) yeah that's I think that's up there yeah um so now I guess real quickly a recap of the scooter scale uh-huh, of mm-hmm. the past season. Okay. Uh, really shouldn't be any surprises now based off of the conversation that we just had. Yeah. Aaron, your top score for episodes, the, the highest ep- rating that you gave episodes was a 4.5. 
and you gave two episodes of 4.5. Uh, Chuck versus the Frosted Tips, episode three, and then episode seven, Chuck versus the Santa Suit. Okay, all right. Um, surprised I like Frosted Tips that much, but I'll, I'll allow it. <laughs> I was I was surprised as well. <laughs> I was in a good mood that day. <laughs> I also the highest I went was four point five, and that was for Chuck versus the Santa Suit. The lowest we got was well, I I want to say two. But your specific score was two followed by four question marks, <laughs> which is what you gave Chuck versus the baby. OK. Mm -hmm. And I gave Chuck versus the bullet train. <laughs> you gave it two followed by four question marks. No, I just gave it a okay. normal two. Right. You gave it two four question yeah. marks. Mm -hmm. Chuck versus the baby. So that means that the average score, your average score was three point two five. OK. And then my average score was 3.32. Okay. So I like the season a little bit more mm -hmm. than you. But then our median score, both of us had three. Okay. So I guess yeah. we're very, very much aligned on this season. Yeah. As we are usually. I don't think this is, we're not, we're not one of those podcasts where you got two hosts who have, you know, different views on things and they argue. We're kind of very copacetic. Almost always here at Go Check Yourself. Yeah, it's probably, we we probably should have rethought that um, there at the beginning, but now here we are at the end. It's the way things are. <laughs> By choosing such an aggressive sounding name for a podcast with two people who are <laughs> very cordial and yeah. polite, mm -hmm. except for when we're not. So how many corn dogs now would you say that you want to give season five overall? Um, so I would give this season um, basically, yeah, what what you just said with our um, our average scores and our medians, I would say a three. Um, this was definitely by no means the strongest season of Chuck. Um, in fact, I would say in my memory, thinking back on it now, thinking of my first viewing of the season... Um, just talking about it, like a lot of episodes, even the ones that are kind of funny in hindsight, felt like a bummer to watch. Um, we, I see on our schedule, we will be talking about the uh, our feelings on the finale, so I'll save that for then. I know I've been teasing it a lot, but I just like the season had some high points, definitely, and had some things that brought out the old Chuck magic. But I think it was generally just like. Not the strongest. They didn't have the budget. They didn't have uh, the ideas. I don't know. They just, like, they had two main villains who were not really very interesting, uh, either as performers or as written. Um, they had, like, a, a questionable decision to continue the will they, won't they by making Sarah lose her memory. Um they had like some weird one-off episodes that just like confused me about why they were happening when they were happening. So I'm going to be kind and just have like a middle of the road, like three and just say like, it's the final season of Chuck. It was nice. It was nice to see it. It was nice to finish it out. Um, but it's definitely not like if, if I was going to be recommending Chuck to someone, I might even put a disclaimer and say like, the end is not the best. But it's like it's worth seeing how it all plays out, I guess. What about you? I I agree. I also gave it a three. Okay. I think that I'm grateful that we got this final season to yep. wrap things up. And I appreciate that the show's writers attempted to kind of keep th keep things interesting throughout yeah. by taking these kinds of big swings. I don't think uh, all of them paid off necessarily. Mm. I don't know if most of them paid off necessarily. There were certainly some high highs but overall i think there was a lot more confusion and yeah. disappointment i think it's still a fun and enjoyable season to watch like i was kind of nervous going into it of being mm. like oh we got to do season five yeah. like how's this gonna but i think i think it's still fine I, yeah. I don't think it hits the like you said the old chuck magic there's it's not really super present here which is disappointing because that's when you kind of want the last big dose of it yeah so i think that if you're a fan and a viewer of the previous four seasons, then you'll more or less be on board with this and you'll be accepting of it maybe. But I wouldn't, to your point, I wouldn't use any episodes from season five as an example to yeah. someone who's uninitiated to be like, oh, this shows like I don't. Yeah. To your yeah. point about the disclaimer, like I um, wouldn't necessarily be like, yeah, no, it's 
season five gets a little shaky. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, a, but I'm glad that we had it. But they do go to uh, a nudist camp. So if you want to see that, it's they there. They do. And they get handsy at uh, Riverside at the yeah. resort. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't we all? So now it's time for our good old friend, Chuck Mary Kill. So excited. Mary something about the season or I, something from the season or something about the season, I guess. Once either, again, either or no rules, matter. just right. <laughs> <laughs> you should copyright that. That's not, that's really catchy. That, <laughs> I feel like you could do something with that. So, Aaron, what would you like to marry? OK, so uh, as is fitting, I have a couple here. Um, Stanley married and- couple. Yeah, well, literally, my first one is about a couple. It is Stan ah. Lee and Beckman's implied torrid sexual history. <laughs> I really liked that idea. Um, we liked to see Beckman and Roan's like history. We actually got a little clip of that. We got to like learn a little bit about it. But having the implication that Stan Lee has a big crush on Beckman uh, was really funny, really like egregious and weird but in a good way so i enjoyed that um joshua gomez and morgan having a little more to do emotionally a little bit of range in his acting performance was very exciting i know we talked about that in frosted tips we talked about that in some of the like mind melding episodes um i think we've had a lot of trouble with morgan as a character in past seasons Uh, we did reflect on how much better we felt about him um in like seasons three through five, but it was kind of nice to see him stretch his wings, take mm-hmm. to the skies a little bit and be like a, a different kind of creepy asshole. Uh, that was nice. <laughs> um, Jeff and Lester's final performance. I would say that I didn't quite feel that they were like, quote unquote, redeemed in the way that like the show seems to want me to think that they were. But I did really enjoy that moment from them. I thought it was funny that they uh, were swept off to Germany, possibly into uh, some sort of uh, nefarious situation or possibly into a great situation, possibly with David Hasselhoff. But I did uh, like their farewell. And then lastly, I just have to shout them out again. I really enjoyed Shaw's performance in Chuck versus the Santa suit. That's a uh, cornucopia of things to appreciate uh i basically i had i was trying to think of something trying to think of something that i've haven't we haven't talked about before necessarily Mm -hmm. and so i was thinking that i realized today i didn't really realize it before but i think it's pretty cool that they had this entire season because and i hope i'm right about this but chuck doesn't have the intersect at all for this season right there's no point that he has the intersect right and so i think that it's really I think that was a cool choice on the writer's part that because so many of the earlier seasons, you know, all the other seasons basically revolve around Chuck yeah. being the intersect, his relationship with the intersect. Yeah. He doesn't want the intersect. He does want the intersect. The intersect gives, gives his life value. It, does, it takes away value. Yeah. Um, so I think that I really appreciated that they did the entire final season with Chuck not having the intersect. Mm-hmm. And it shows that Chuck as a character has grown and matured over the course of the Mm -hmm. show. And then it also proves that he is, you know, once and all, once and for all definitively a more than capable hero, even without the intersect. Cause there's always that question through Mm -hmm. the other seasons of like, well, can he do this without the intersect? And season five proves that he can absolutely do it. And so I thought that that was kind of a, I don't want to say risk, but that was a choice that the writers made Mm -hmm. that I think was actually kind of very subtle. It's not Mm -hmm. something that you're actively thinking about as you're watching, but I think it pays off because that is a sort of a cool way to end the show that he obviously the intersect is still causing him grief, enormous Mm -hmm. amounts of grief and distress by being in other people's heads and people trying to get it. But he himself doesn't have it and is operating fine and is still a good leader and spy and everything. So that's a really good choice. Yeah, I like that. Thanks. Now, what would you like to kill? So, I mean... Following that, I'm like, mine are just like little bullet points of things I didn't really like. But um, this is going to come as no surprise to anyone who has listened to the first hour of this episode. But I was not a big fan of Quinn or Decker as villains. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that neither of them, like 
Quinn at least kind of had an explanation, like kind of had a reason. Like I didn't really love the way he was written or his performance or how he would randomly be sucked out of windows, but be fine. Um, It (laughs) almost would have been better if he was just an immortal being who could survive anything thrown at him uh, like Thanos. But um, wasn't really a fan of either of them. Didn't really think that either of them brought anything new in terms of energy or in terms of like, making me think about the effects of the government or the CIA or the intersect on people's lives. Like they were just kind of very milk toast, run of the mill, like stinky boys. Um, and I was not, I, I didn't really want that for the final season. Uh, it felt like previous seasons had more interesting uh, villains or villain turns. Like Shaw stands out as someone who is very interesting, but even like, Rourke was kind of like, he at least had like the fact that he was Chevy Chase going for him. Um, He was kind of like an asshole and he was like in tech, which is different. Like these just felt like one off villains that were like accidentally expanded into multiple episodes and it wasn't great for me. Um, From Chuck versus Bo, the the whole rainbows bullshit um, that I was forced to remember when I was rereading what happened in that episode and was not happy about it because I would have preferred that stay lost in the ether. But uh, whatever was going on in terms of being slut shamey there, not good. Um, Outdated, but also not good at the time either. So just kind of a bummer in an episode that was already not great. And then I think I mentioned this at the time, but although I obviously loved Shaw's like whole thing. The does Chuck know about the baby stinger at the end of Chuck versus the Santa suit? I just think about that a lot. Like even not in relation to this podcast. Does Chuck know about the baby? Does he know? Does he? About the- I'm not sure. <laughs> um, it just like, is so stupid. Like I understand why that feels like a good stinger, but like, it's just, it's just stupid because it's like, we know Sarah doesn't have a baby and because like, it's not like if that was like at the first episode and then the rest of the season was about like this baby, which obviously it isn't and it couldn't be. And I don't even know what that would be, but it's just like really like, like false advertising. It's kind of like demeaning to Sarah in a weird way. That's like saying like, Oh, she kept this from him for five seasons. Like it's, it's just like, I, I don't like what it's doing. It feels really cheap. And it bums me out when I remember that it happened, which is often. Well, it feels very soap opera esque. Yeah. Like a cliffhanger about a a mysterious baby. Yeah. And and so yeah, I I get that. I think that's a good a good point. I think about the villains too, like it's hard because coming out of season three where you have Shaw and then season four where you have Volokov, who are both really fleshed out villains yeah. that you really spend a lot oh of time with. Oh my god, with. I can't believe I didn't mention Volkov. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And then you also have Vivian Volkov, who on a smaller scale, but like, okay, like still somewhat interesting, yeah. like this woman who's scorned and yeah. about her father. And so like all of those, because you know that Chuck can do this, but then you go, so you think that there's going to be like one more of those kinds of yeah. villains for the fifth season and there's just not and like you said they just have these kinds of really flimsy shallow one-dimensional villains that they that feel like one-off episode villains that they expand and stretch out to be the the final villains i think like you could make an argument and i'm sure this is what they were going for that like the actual villains of the season were like first morgan and then sarah but that's like not that's not enough. Like, like, it's nice to see Chuck contend with his best friend and then his wife and, like, have them be, like, a more negative uh, presence in the show and have them be doing bad things and stuff. But, like, the show is not the kind... Like, Chuck is not the kind of show that's really going to go there where, like, the final season is, like, Chuck against Sarah and they're, like, Sarah is an actual villain. Like, they don't... Mm-hmm. They're not interested in that. And even, like, with the Frosted Tips, Morgan is not really, like... He he does he does get some stuff to do, but he's not like a threat. And I just like I missed that like there is a threat to Chuck's existence. And like if if they wanted to go in the direction that it was like an internal threat, sure, but they don't commit to that enough. And I still have to deal with Quinn and Decker, so it's just like 
not not right for me. Well, my kill for the season, if I've said it once, I've said it a hundred times, <laughs> that I can't believe that two upstanding citizens like Chuck and Sarah would carve their names <laughs> into a house that they do not own. I do not care if it ended up being important to the plot, if it ended up saving Sarah's memory or making her, you know, do whatever. They shouldn't have done it. And I'm deeply troubled that the show seems to condone property violation. I actually didn't tell you um, when Seth and I moved into our new apartment. Uh, we were looking <laughs> at one of the door frames. God, don't tell me. Don't. <laughs> oh, my God. This will be the end of Go Chuck Yourself. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. I meant that we found their carving, not that we did it ourselves. Oh, I thought you. Yeah, I thought no, you no, were no, saying no, no. We absolutely. We. I would never. No, we found this. Uh, this weird little Chuck plus Sarah written into one of our door frames, and we were like, "What's that about?" Well, you, you both of you have quick little, you know, four letter names, so <laughs> mm-hmm, you get. Yeah. You, it would be easy to carve your names in. So then, we've been teasing it for a while. We've never really gone into it. We've never really talked about it. We got to talk about the the finale. I know. The final it's a big moments. conversation. I. I don't even know where to where to begin. Well, why don't do you want to take it away? Do you want me to take you, it away? You take it away. I'll I'll chime in. Okay, so the the, the fun finale is controversial. You know, people have different thoughts and feelings about it. The first time that I watched the finale when it aired in 2012, I was really disappointed. Mm-hmm. I was underwhelmed. I was confused. I was hurt. I didn't like it. Not so much that it ruined the rest of the series for uh, me, but I, it didn't like ruin like my my memories of it. But I certainly was like disappointed and a little incredulous. Yeah, I was just kind of like, that's it. So I was very much in the camp of this is unequivocally a bad finale for Chuck. Mm-hmm. And I was especially upset because I felt like the show ended by basically lobotomizing Sarah. Yeah. Who's maybe the best character on the show. Yes. And also a fan favorite for many people. Sarah is such an active autonomous character in the show and to end with her being stripped of basically all of this and being brainwashed and not really having like her personality that's developed over the show just felt really upsetting and just kind of weird Mm -hmm. and it also felt like we spent five seasons so you know however many years rooting for chuck and sarah yeah and you want them to be together and then the show is like nope yeah they still can't have it yeah and bye bye (laughs) and you're like that you can't you couldn't have just given this to me after five seasons like you can't and so these are all the reasons that i didn't like it and i don't like it but watching it now with a somewhat different perspective having learned what we've learned about the intent behind the finale Mm -hmm. from the behind the scenes stuff i still don't love this as a finale or as a final scene but i at least respect it a bit more and understand what they were going for so if the idea of the season finale was to serve as a bookend to the season premiere or the series premiere, then I think it makes sense because they have all the callbacks to the first episode. And of course, the first episode ends with Chuck and Sarah on the beach. Chuck is scared, uncertain about the future, but Sarah assures him that she's going to protect him, mm-hmm. even if he doesn't really have a reason to trust her at this point. Mm-hmm. So then it makes sense that in the finale, Sarah is uncertain about the future and doesn't know what's going to happen or what's going on. And Chuck is asking her to trust him, even though she has no reason to trust Chuck. But Chuck is still saying that I'm going to protect you. You know, I hope you can trust me. Uh You don't really have much of a reason to, but I will give you reasons to to trust me. So I think that does make it a little clearer in my mind of like, okay. And I think I mentioned it before, but like before I thought that the episode was a downer because I was like, oh, my God, they're going to have such a hard life now. Like Sarah is going to have all these challenges and like, she's not going to have her memory and how's this going to affect their relationship. But I, when I think of it now, I'm like, I, Chuck is ultimately a positive, optimistic show. Mm -hmm. I'm confident that Chuck and Sarah will be able to work through Sarah's issues and Mm -hmm. get back on track. Or I have this other idea too, which maybe they can't work it out Uh and maybe they break up permanently. But I think that both characters would still be okay in the end because Mm -hmm. of how much they've, grown and learned from each other Mm -hmm. so i think either way the characters will be okay and that makes me feel more positive about the finale even if it's not like the you know big happy finale that maybe everyone was hoping for i think that's very well thought out i i agree with most of what you're saying i'm making it sound like i don't 
I agree with what you're saying about the book ending of the pilot and the finale. I think that is really interesting and really cool when a show can do that and pull it off. And I think like just like simply breaking it down to what you just said. Um, I do like it in theory to say that like they're each reassuring each other. Like it's, it's a, a flip flop of their roles for each other. Like mm. they've each grown, like all of those things. Um, I think that could have been done without Sarah having lost her memory. Like, I don't think that was necessary. Um, True. But yeah, so that's that's my first point. I do agree with you saying that. But having watched uh, Feedback explain that he wanted the romantic tension and the will they won't they to continue throughout season five, I think is a mistake. And it's like, I don't want to talk ill about the uh, writer and creator of uh, Ambulance, which is coming to theater soon. But I think it's like, the sign of like an insecure writer to say that like they can't create something interesting enough to hold the audience's attention or create like challenges for a couple that isn't like, are they going to be together? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's like falling back on a very like old and like kind of immature trope. Like it's, it's fun for the first couple seasons and like, it's it's very easy to fall back on as like a source of tension um but i don't think it was needed um and i would have liked to see them do something else to have chuck and sarah face something together and like that so that kind of goes back into the like villain thing i would have liked there to be a better threat um or like if it had to be them facing off against each other, like maybe it's an idealistic thing where Chuck and Sarah come down on opposite sides of some sort of uh, issue and then have to like figure it out um, and figure out what it means for their relationship. So that's that's my thought on that. I think the one magical kiss just feels like this, this is harsh, but I like I, I can't believe that, like, not not that Chuck is, like, the most mature show, but it feels like something that I would have written in, like, fan fiction in middle school. Like, that is that is so silly. I understand what they're going for, but it's, like, it's it doesn't work for the tone of the show to have it be, like, this one magical kiss will save everything. Like, that's not really what the show has been up to this point. And then adding on to that, I think it's very bold and I can appreciate the, like, I, I appreciate that they decided to go for an ambiguous ending. Um, I think that's always a bold move and I think it's interesting that they decided to do it, but I don't think that's the tone of Chuck. So I think it's it just feels jarring. I agree with you that it doesn't ruin the rest of the show for me, but it just feels weird because we've ended on cliffhangers before, but we've never ended on like, you don't know what's going to happen and you get to decide. Like, I, I don't, I don't feel like that is the vibe of any other season or episode of Chuck. So it's just kind of odd that they decided to do that. And what it makes me think of most, which I think is a more extreme example, but I'm, am reminded of like how I met your mother and how like they had this arc planned out that works as a concept when you like explain it, like when you're not watching it, but had like the characters kind of developed past that point to a way where it felt like a regression for the show and the characters to have them end up like at this, uh, like at this place that the first season was implying, but like later seasons, it didn't go that way. Um, and it's just kind of like, it feels like they had an idea and then they stuck with it, um, maybe to the detriment of what, like, what the fans liked about the show. Cause like, we didn't necessarily like the will that, I mean, we liked the will they won't they, but what we liked most was seeing all these people work together as a team and taking that away from us and being like, will it ever come back? We don't know is just kind of not... I, I don't think shows have to do what the fans want, but I think this was, like, a step too far in, like, unnecessary drama that they could have been spending on, like, a more, like, interesting or dramatic or, like, in-character conflict. And so, again, doesn't ruin the whole show for me. 
but I don't really like it as a choice. You brought up a lot of really good, interesting points. I think to because you had mentioned that keeping the will they won't they that yeah I guess it sounds like it's a easy way out to like to create that kind of tension between yeah. two people who are but it was making me think though that like in the previous seasons there were so many good examples or instances where I felt like Chuck and Sarah were having had like semi seemingly realistic relationship issues yeah. that I was like oh this feels very relatable I could see this being something that people would be going through yeah. it's not necessarily like a make or break thing but and it felt like they they were really mining personal experience yeah. for that in the writer's room, which I imagine that they would have to. Mm -hmm. And it seems like for this season, that person left yeah. the writer's room. Like there, there was no one bringing that kind of touch to it. Yeah. No one in the writer's room was married. The one married person left. Yeah. That kind of sounds like that's what happened. Yeah. But uh, and then I do agree that the one magical kiss thing sounds very Disney movie. Yeah which is very all like out of nowhere kind yeah. of like it's very cheesy and it tries to play it like it's this it knows that it's sentimental but maybe it will work so yeah. then maybe it's but it just feels very hokey to be that's the note that you're ending on and then I agree it is jarring that it ends on that's like part of the reason maybe that people dislike the the ambiguous ending so much is that it's totally not it feels very out of character for yeah. the show and not aligned with everything else that we've been come to know and expect from Chuck. This is a a comedy action show, yeah. you know, that used to be on eight o'clock on Monday nights. I mean, going back to Friends, it's like if Friends ended and like they they ended. Friends with ended? I thought it was still on. <laughs> If it was like now, now I'm gonna have to like remember all the friends' characters' names. But if it's like yeah, dopey, sleepy, doc, <laughs> bashful, if it's like sneezy, the, they're like, oh, are they gonna have a baby? We don't know. Oh, are Ross and Rachel gonna get together? Is with or without you gonna play? We don't know. Like it's just like there. That's there are things that pull off ambiguous endings to a like to a great degree, but. It's not the tone of this specific show, so it just feels weird, and it strikes everyone as weird, and everyone gets weird about it. So now we have the lesson of the season. What did you learn this season, Aaron? I learned that uh, when I complain about a piece of media and say that they should be brave enough to have a new villain and not just keep bringing back old villains, uh, I am lying, and I do want the old villains to come back. Well, how often do you complain in that fashion a lot oh. well, we were we were talking before we recorded about uh horizon zero dawn and the sure. current sequel horizon forbidden west and actually it has the same villain because he's like resurrected at the end of zero dawn or whatever it's yeah. like the same ai and i was like jesus like isn't there like something else that they could do but i learned from chuck this season that i i do just want shaw to come back and be a threatening presence in your life in your bedroom. Both both things. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, what about you? Uh, well, this season I learned that it's not every day that, you know, you fight for multiple seasons of a show to keep it on the air. And you get you actually get the opportunity to give the show the final season and the writers and the cast and everyone knows that it's the final season. That's a rare thing. And I think it's a unique thing and it's special. But with that being said, I think that if you find yourself in the situation as a fan or as a viewer, you do have to manage your expectations because the, if you have very high expectations, they probably will not be met in this yeah. cir circumstance. And that's OK. Maybe I would have wished this final season was different in some ways, many ways, maybe. But I ultimately accept it for what it is. And I am thankful that we have it. And it wasn't just like Chuck just ended after season two or yeah. whatever. I agree. So. Season five is better than no season five, I guess, in my mind. At least, yeah, this 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 one is maybe right, right on the edge of that, but it is better than no season five. Anyhow, it's uh, time to say farewell to season five and I guess the entire season or series of Chuck. It's crazy. Yeah, it's weird. It's like I know we just literally just <laughs> like shit on season five and said it's barely <laughs> good enough to be worth it. But yeah, it is, um, this has been a huge part of my life. 
and it is very strange. Obviously, we can watch Chuck whenever we want on HBO Max, um, but yeah, it is it is very weird to be saying we're done. We we watched everything. We watched all the content that is reasonable for us to watch. <laughs> Maybe not all the content that exists, but we didn't see those those directors commentaries no, or whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> Haven't figured out how to relay that as a podcast. <laughs> uh yeah, it's strange. It's also, you know, Chuck, so the last episode I was correct when I said how many episodes of Chuck are there? I said there's like 90, right? There's uh, 91. Okay. Mm-hmm. Don't you have to like get to 100 to be syndicated as a television show? Like oh. to end up in those other things? They were oh, that's so interesting. close. Yeah, they were so close. They could have just, if they'd had a full fifth season, like if they just, if we'd just eaten a few more Subways, Chris. <laughs> then Chuck could have gone on to be playing on ch- channels like TBS TNT. 3 p.m. in the afternoon. I could TNT. honestly see that. Like, I'm bu- I'm now bummed that we don't get that. Yeah, it's strange that that's not the case. Yeah. Because it, it, or like, on the USA Network, there's absolutely no reason why Chuck is should not be on the USA Network yeah, at all times. Yeah, playing with Psych, playing with Monk, playing with Burn Notice. White Collar. White Collar. Suits. I don't think Suits. Is Suits on USA. Riz- Rizzoli and Isles? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that Are was TNT. TNT. I think oh, it was okay. TNT. But. Gotcha. So, yeah, it's uh, season five. Uh, you know, glad that we had to, we got this last dance. And uh, it will be weird uh, not not having season five or any Chuck seasons. We have exhausted our Chuck seasons. We have, for now. For now, I guess. But the, I, so I guess we don't know what the future of Go Chuck Yourself is. We don't know. We don't know yet. We're we don't know. We'll figure we it out. Keep working on it. Yeah, it's going to be uh, probably a little. If you've made it this far in this episode, you must really care about the future of <laughs> Go Chuck Yourself. And so I will tell you that uh, maybe things. I don't know if they'll be as regular as they were before. Things might be getting a little irregular. I'm actually going to stop you there, Chris, and say we're going to do it again. We're going once more around the track. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a joke we're not doing that yet you sure you sure <laughs> i'm gonna teach you a lesson to make those kinds of jokes that's it we're starting it again. Oh, no. <laughs> let me rest that would be that would be a lot yeah uh. <laughs> but yeah like like chris said i uh i would definitely not um not just unsubscribe from us immediately i think we might oh, have God, some don't. updates Please don't. <laughs> um if if there is future for Chuck, if there are future... Oh, God. Uh, oh, that would be so cool. It would be really cool. Um, it we would, have a few movies to do. Yeah, that's it, what I was going to say. Um, oh, the, sorry. The actors, the actors, the characters of Chuck. Um, there's plenty of non-TV uh, media content around. There's Chuck comic books and stuff. Like, there might be new ones in the future. So there's there's stuff for us to look into that we might look into i guess we shall i guess this is an ambiguous ending of go chuck yourself it is <laughs> wow we uh we were giving them shit but it's hard it's hard to not have an ambiguous ending i guess so until then this has been chris gillespie reminding you that food is sexy and this is aaron arana reminding you that anything is possible anything is possible thanks for listening we hope you learned a lot we hope you enjoyed and we'll see you real soon As always, a big thanks to the artist Hadakoa and the fine folks at freemusicarchive.org for providing us with our theme song, Warm Up. If you want to drop us a line, you can reach us at gochuckyourselfpodcast at gmail.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe to Go Chuck Yourself on your preferred podcast platform. Thanks again. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.